Good morning, everyone. My name is Josh Beck, and I'm the College of Young Adults intern here at Pear Orchard. This brings us to week number 10 on, pure t on studying the Puritans and how they approached um, living as a Christian. This week's topic is going to be on education, and I think education is one of the, um, the biggest ways that we could um, easily turn to uh, the lasting impact that the Puritans had on both England and America. And so I'm going to start us off with a quote from John Milton. The end, then, of learning is to repair the ruins of our first parents by regaining to know God aright, and out of that knowledge to love him, to imitate him, to be like him, as we may the nearest by possessing our souls of true virtue, which being united to the heavenly grace of faith makes up the highest perfection. The topic of Puritans and education intersects with many other Puritan subjects, theology, philosophy, vocation, ministry, preaching, family, and law. And all of these factors, uh, it may be said that education is birthed out of these. And so three themes that, I, that we're gonna see throughout this lesson is that the Puritans viewed education as being theocentric, essential, and multifaceted. So what does it mean to have a theocentric education? Well, quite plainly, it means having God at the core of all that you learn and pursue to learn. Now, does this mean you can only study the Bible and Christian writings? Certainly not. Although I think we could all deal with a little more time spent on the Bible than the myriad of other things we choose to devote our brain power towards. But no, theocentric education is not limited to the Bible or the writings of church fathers. In fact, it is almost unlimited because you see a theocentric education is not merely what you are learning, sorry, that's my dog, uh, learning, but to what goal and what purpose you are learning. Like everything else in our lives and edu lives, education and what we set in front of ourselves to devote to quickly becomes a thing of the heart. Therefore, our heart must be theocentric and the Puritans knew this and applied it to how they approach school and education. The Puritans view of education as essential is evident across the pages of history. When the Puritan Oliver Cromwell came to power in England in the 1650s, he quickly began to develop and fund primary schools all across the country in order to increase literacy. So in turn, more people, rich or poor, could read and meditate on the word of God. He felt so strongly about education, he developed a committee or a task force to travel all of England and see where any sort of lapse in education might be. Similarly, when the Puritans first arrived and began to, and began to settle their Massachusetts Bay Colony, it did not take them long to begin to develop an institution of higher learning. A quote from New England's First Fruits says, after God had carried us safe to New England and we had builded our houses, provided necessaries to our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship and settled the civil government, one of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to, prosper, or to posterity. As you can all, as you can tell, learning was the highest prior, was one of the highest priorities to them. I mean, as she, you know, listed out, it goes, you know, basic survival things, setting up a church, setting up a government, and right after that, they were ready to set up a school. And so. This fervor led to the establishment of Harvard College or Harvard University as we know it today. It was established in 1636 as the first university in, the, in America, more than 50 years earlier than the College of William and Mary. So we can clearly see that the Puritans love to be educated and love to educate. But let's look at why they believed it was so essential. As we have talked about previously, the Puritans believed 
and rightfully so, that their children were not their own, but simply to loan, but simply on loan from God. And as covenant children, they looked to their parents for a strong Christian rearing. There is no doubt that the educational life of the Puritan began in the home. In keeping with an ideal covenant household, the salvation of the children and their spiritual well-being was at first was at first placed in the heart of every godly parent. They universally understood that education was a means to, to that end. Therefore, they believed that the education of their children in religion was their premier duty. They would often imagine the horrors of what their children might say of them if they went to hell on account of their negligence in education. Thus, they sought to catechize their children as soon as possible and instruct them in the scriptures. This included daily devotions, either in the morning or around the dinner table, and sermon discussions or an application. So about a month ago, um, we received a video of our um, of my nephew, uh, Lewis Benson. He's the son of Victoria and Braden Benson. And Lewis is about, um, I guess he's, he's coming up on a year and a half in two days. Um, and and so in this video, Lew, uh, you can hear Victoria in the background asking Lewis simple catechism questions. You know, who, who made you the chief purpose of man? Um, you know, the, the very beginning of um, catechism. And, and I remember thinking, and this is, um, you know, definitely something, uh, you know, my cynical heart and my kind of unbelieving um, heart in some aspects is I was like, what is this, you know, year and a half year old going to learn from this catechism? You know, he's, he's not going to be absorbing anything really. And, you know, and, you know, why, why are we starting now? You know, and, and I was, as I was reading this, um, and, you know, going and diving deeper into education and how the Puritans viewed education, I was um, humbled to say the least. It was, um, I looked as I was going through this, I immediately remembered um, that video and uh, Lewis semi answering, but in a way kind of, you know, inarticulately saying things and was like, oh, you know, he's not, he doesn't know what he's saying, but it, it's, and oh, in a way, it's not necessarily even if he does have, um, you know, the the cognitive ability to answer these questions. It's about Victoria and Braden's parenting. It's about laying that foundation that from you know out of the womb, he's going to hear these truths over and over, and that is the beautiful thing. And my cynicism and um, clear evidence that I have a lot of work to do at, um, before I become a parent um, was revealed. And, um, and so I just thought it was a, a great example of, you know, right from the very beginning, we need to be teaching and thoroughly investing in uh, kids' lives. So going back to the Puritans and, um, you know, and I just wanted to shout out to Victoria and Braden. Um, but going back to the Puritans, uh, although, you know, they sought to educate their children in religion, they were a little less effective at actually just teaching them to read. Uh, it can be hard. Not everyone is made to be a teacher. I think COVID-19 and suddenly we're having, um, you know, parents are having to teach their kids at home and realizing the, the struggles that this can cause. I think this has been a um, really big learning experience um, for parents about teachers and just education in general. And so the Massachusetts Bay Colony realized, um, quoting, the great neglect of many parents and masters in training their children in learning and labor and other employments which may be profitable to the Commonwealth. 
and therefore established an early law, I mean, we're, we're talking 1642, mandating the parent, the parental duty of teaching children to read and understand the principles of religion and the capital laws of this country. So looking at that quote, you know, two things immediately jumped out to me. One, again, the Puritans understood that education was essential. They understood that having a literate population is something that not only, you know, are you going to be able to read the Bible and learn more about um, God, but you're going to be, as a, as a society, better off. Even today, we can see studies that the median literacy rate has a direct correlation on so many different things. And I think it's just um, when we, when, when those, you know, studies come out and it's like, well, you know, look at this, we can easily go back and look at history and be like, yeah, we know this. We, well, this is, this is understood. So why are we trying to reinvent the wheel? Just let's place the importance back on education. And then second, um, the wording. They didn't say capital laws of this country and principles of religion, but they said, read and understand the principles of religion and then the capital laws of this country. So just the, again, the theocentric mindset of the Puritans is unbelievable. Every, whether they're creating law or education, it was all about learning and being devoted to the Lord. Well, um, going back um, to this law, apparently this law was not well observed because it left the responsibility up to the parents and gave way for the old deluder Satan Act. Uh, one chief project of that old deluder Satan the law read, was to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures. And I think that's, you know, at first glance, I read it as diluter, um, as in making weaker, um, or kind of if you dilute sweet tea, it's suddenly, you know, not as good, but it's diluter, as in becoming, um, uh, to become um, oh, there it is. Uh, to deceive into believing something which is false, to lead into error, or to dupe, as we're more commonly uh, familiar. And so, again, their laws are so God-focused that it, it's, in this day and age, it's, um, it's humbling, and it's also just kind of, wow, we have come a long way from that. Um, and so this new law, the Old Deluder Satan Act, uh, gave towns of 50 families the responsibility of offering a free public education so that children could learn to read. This is where the New England Primer and varieties of horn books would be used as tools. It is evident from early legislature and these tools that reading and the scriptures were closely connected. It was also around this age, before the age of five, that girls started needlework. Girls were not educated beyond this point. I'm sorry, ladies. Um, if I was making the rules, it would have been different. But um, from here on out, uh, your ladies were taught to read. And then after that, not so much. Um, so moving on. Uh, the purpose of grammar schools was to train boys for the university. If boys lacked the ability in elementary school, they would work with their parents until or while they learned a trade. However, if they excelled in their primary school, they would continue on to grammar school. In grammar school, the boys would learn the subjects English grammar, Latin, and Greek. Boys that could make it through would, uh, would be in grammar school for about seven years. According to the exact accounts kept in the, at the Boston Latin School, which was established in 1712, the first three years were spent learning Latin accidents and, uh, and works in Latin like, um, I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, Aesop's fa Fables, I believe, um, and then fourth year or Erasmus uh, 
and then fifth year Cicero, um, more Erasmus, and then sixth year, more Cicero and Ovid, um, along with Lucius, Virgil, and the seventh year, Cicero, Justin, Isocrates, Homer, Virgil, Horace, Perseus, and the Greek Testament. A lot. <laughs> Every college hopeful was to master Latin because that was all that was spoken in the university classroom. Higher education was certainly the matrix of, of Puritan thinking. This is evidenced by the, or this is by the influence of William Perkins and William Ames had in their respective university posts there in Harvard. Um, much thought was being spawned on, on the best Christian approach to scholarship at their time. And that's between the 1590s and 1630s. The predominant notion among influential Puritan minds was that of educational integration. Among their common convictions was to use, was the use of logic as a means to truth, along with scripture and nature, setting them apart from their Reformation predecessors. Although Harvard was modeled after Cambridge, as well as the University of Paris, it was unique in its um, curricular structure, in that metaphysics was left out of the six arts. That's logic, grammar, rhetoric, mathematics, physics, and theology. This is because technologia took the place of metaphysics, fulfilling the roles normally assigned to metaphysics of defining ontology, epistemology, cosmology, and anthropology. But what, what was technologia? By technologia, the Puritans did not mean technology, as we do. Technology uh, to us usually means um, applied technique or referencing the products of an applied technique like a computer. However, in their usage, technologia was a Latin transliteration of a word borrowed from Greek. It was the compound of techno, meaning skill or art, and logia, meaning the study of. Technologia was also known as technometry, the measure of a skill or art. By either word, technologia or technometry, therefore, they meant the study of the theory of the interrelation of the arts and science. Technologia was the philosophical core of New England mind through which the American Puritans sought to understand the relationship between God, the arts, and the scholar. It was a philosophy of the encyclopedic integration of the arts based on the concept of the circle of knowledge. And so I'm gonna share my screen real quick because as I was reading this, I would have been completely lost had I not you know, had a nice little diagram. So I'm gonna share that with you, so bear with me. All right. Okay, so this is the circle of knowledge. And as you see, um, we have the encyclopedia, um, or, uh, you know, at the, the center. And so we have God, things, man, and art. But on the outside, that's where you get the, um, the six subjects, if you will. And so logic, the art of di discoursing well, um, grammar, the art of speaking and writing well, rhetoric, the art of speaking and writing ornately. I'm sorry, I cut off a little. Um, math, the art of quantifying well. Physics, the art of analyzing nature well. And theology, the art of living well. And so we're gonna explore this inner circle real quick. And so as you see, blown it up a little bit. I think this is a good diagram. And this is what the Puritans used to um, really establish their curriculum. And so at the top, we have God. And so God has creation, that, and we're going to label that as things. And so man discovers these things, and through art, they imitate it. Um, you know, this can have a you know, many different meanings. Um, it can, you know, whether it's art as in painting or art as in singing, um, you know, just kind of the, we see God's creation and how beautiful it is and man wants to imitate it. 
And through that art, we're bringing glory to God, not through our actions and outright, um, you know, workspace type theology, but I'm doing this for the glorification of God. And so that kind of thought process was what the Puritans used. However, this diagram, I think, is has been corrupted um, over time and in certain circles of education. And so we're going to see how potentially um, things might be displayed now. So we get rid of the connection to God and glory is uh, then moved. And sorry for the drawing. Um, but so now instead of including God, we're now glorifying the creation and completely forgetting the creator in our, um, <coughs> excuse me, in, um, in our love of science and um, what we call technology today. And, you know, all of those things are great um, and, you know, deserve to be lauded in, in certain ways. But when you remove God out of it, that's when you um, are worshiping the creation and not the creator. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to go back to. Sorry, one second. And And so I'm just going to do a quick recap now that we've seen the um, diagram. On that one level, encyclopedia was a circle between the subject of study, the person studying it, and the original divine creator or the, of the subject matter. The master design of God's mind via creation came to be represented in the things of the material, natural world. Through scholarship, Humankind discovers God's design and forms this knowledge into an imitation of God's design in the disciplines of the arts and sciences. So again, that was just summarizing that inner smaller circle. Such commitment to educational integration is evidenced by the motto of this on the seal of Harvard. It says Veritas or truth, which is inscribed over three books representing nature, scripture, and logic as the three books of truth. Admission to Harvard consisted of an interview with the president with no applications to fill out yeah. or an essay to write. Great. Normally, he would flip to a passage in the Greek New Testament, expecting a translation of the chosen passage and an exegesis. Maybe we'll bring back the essays. <laughs> um, he would also do the same um, for some work in Latin and would also test the mathematics skills of the prospective student. Pretty intimidating with the president of the university. Anyways, again, the first thing plays a huge role in why education is essential. A theocentric heart will lead to theocentric education, which understands that to learn and know about God is to live while being ignorant of his word is death. The last theme is Puritan, um, the last theme is Puritan education was multifaceted. We have already touched on this point a little with integration of the various subjects. However, this approach goes deeper than wanting to be well-rounded, it goes deeper than wanting to be a well-rounded student or a good use to society. The Puritans loved the liberal arts. For the Puritans, no education was complete if it only included religious knowledge. Samuel, Samuel Rutherford said, it is false that scripture only as contradistinguished from the law of nature can direct us to heaven for both concurreth in a special manner, nor is the, nor is the one exclusive of the other. So basically, he was saying it is not true that the only revelation or truth we as Christians can receive comes from the Bible, but can come from other parts of creation 
as part of God's common grace to man. In addition, the Puritans insisted that the ministers should be learned in a variety of subjects, both religious and earthly, because a minister is able to convey his truths and sermons to his congregation in a variety of ways and illustrations. This conviction came from their view that God is the source of all truth and all truth is God's. I think this is, um, at Pear Orchard, we're blessed with a incredible, um, you know, collection of pastors. Um, and all of them do a great job at taking, at times, very technical, um, you know, points of Christianity and being able to relate them to different things. Um, and I think this is what the Puritans were in a way kind of hinting at, but, you know, we're not all going to be as learned as the next one or as smart as the other. And so they wanted their ministers to be so well educated that they were able to relate with their congregation, whether it was, um, you know, about science or, you know, nature or just very simple interactions with you know that every man had and so not all you know complete head knowledge so the puritan theory of education was a wonderfully unified and integrated system it combined god's special and natural revelations the bible and human knowledge faith and reason the curriculum included both theology and the arts and sciences, both the Bible and the classics. The goals of education were sim similarly comprehensive. They included both piety and knowledge, both becoming like God and preparing to do all things well in daily life in the world. Puritan education aimed to educate the whole person. Samuel, Samuel Willard summarized this by saying, the word of God and the rule of religion teach us not to destroy, but to improve every faculty that is in us to the glory of God who gave them to us. All this integration was possible ultimately because of the Puritans' view of truth. In their view, God was the source and the end of all truth. Therefore, no dichotomy between the religious and the human or natural truth. Um, I'm not sure who said this, I need to go back and quote it, but all streams do naturally lead down to the ocean and all divine truths do similarly, similarly carry us home to God himself, who is the essential truth. As truth comes from God, so it leads back to God. And I think that's such a, a beautiful illustration because nowadays we place such an emphasis on education of where you went to school, what high, what, you know, what middle school, what high school, what college, and that's going to set you up for, um, you know, your life. If you have a good education, you're going to, you know, chances are you're going to have a good career, be able to, you know, provide benevolently to your family, and um, and we act as if comfort is our end goal and by refocusing on and being theocentric in our education we're allow we're able to see that the the real truth the real education is coming from god and that can manifest in whether it's physics or biology or um you know literature or various other things all of it comes from God if it's true. Um, and, you know, I know education can be a um, sticky subject sometimes, but what I would say, what I would encourage, the same way that I um, had to have that realization about um, my little nephew, Lewis, it's not necessarily about, you know, the nuances of how much are they how much are they learning or things like that it's 
about laying the foundation and once you have that foundation seeking to grow out of that foundation um, and so i hope this lesson has been encouraging um, and also maybe shown some areas of growth or um, areas that you can improve upon and if you as always if you have any questions i'd be happy to answer them and um, i hope you have a great rest of your week